Lord, teach us to pray. It sounds very simple, doesn't it? But the question of prayer is a tricky one, even for pastors. I have to confess that prayer intimidates the heck out of me, which may sound strange since I'm supposed to be the prayer in chief, or as someone once called me, a professional Christian. And I guess technically that is true, but it doesn't mean I have any more answers than anyone else. So let me just say this. I believe in prayer, but I don't understand it. Sometimes I think all of my education and training, all it has done is given me more complicated questions. But we've all heard the stories. The woman who had the terminal illness who was cured. The man who was days away from foreclosure and then the job came through. The family whose house was in the path of the storm but somehow remained untouched. We love to tell stories of folks who were in dire straits and prayed to God and their lives turned around. And these usually, stories usually end with an exclamation of, see, prayer works. And of course, these stories are indeed inspiring and a cause for joy. Yet they often also make me feel very conflicted. And passages like this one don't help. Jesus' invitation to just ask God and it will be given to us seems to fly in the face of most of our realities. For more common although less often shared, are the stories of people who prayed to be saved but got pulled under instead. The young mother who dies of cancer. The man who loses his home to foreclosure. The family who lost it all in the storm. For them, it appears prayer didn't work. Did God answer the prayers of one person but ignore those of the other? Our need to make sense of this unjust world requires us to have an answer for that. And stuff happens, just doesn't satisfy. So when disaster strikes, the question becomes, what went wrong? Is it our fault or God's? Most of the time we decide it's our fault. We just didn't pray right or hard enough or long enough. But sometimes we decide it's God's fault and our faith is shaken or shattered altogether? What do we want with a God who doesn't answer our prayers? A God who lets us suffer? So prayer can feel like a theological minefield. But here's the thing. Prayer is also our spiritual lifeline. Coming to terms with prayer is essential. Lord, teach us to pray. Theologian Teilhard de Chardin reminds us that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, but spiritual beings having a human experience. And as spiritual beings, we yearn for a way to cut through the chaos and static of our lives and be in touch with God. We need prayer. Prayer is the language of the Spirit, and so we yearn, like the disciples, to know how to speak it. But before we get to the how question, let's talk a little bit about the why question. Why do we pray? Is it because we need something or want something? Because we are frightened? Because we are grateful or overwhelmed? Because it's Sunday and that's what's written in the bulletin? In seminary, where nothing stays simple, I learned that there are countless ways to pray. Contemplative prayer, formal prayer, extemporaneous prayer, prayer of adoration, prayers of confession, prayers of petition, each with their own vocabulary and schedule. Talk about complicated. However, writer Anne Lamott, one of the world's great out-of-the-box Christians, has identified only three prayers she feels she'll ever need. And they go like this. Help me, help me, help me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And wow. And really, when you think about it, those three pretty much have it covered. We pray when we are overwhelmed and need help. We pray when we are grateful that we received help. And we pray when life is too wonderful for words. In other words, we pray when we crave 
and respond to the presence of God. And that's what prayer really is, opening ourselves up to the presence of God. That's it. No complicated formulas, no special poses, no pious vocabulary, just the desire to be, to simply be with God. We pray to touch that sacred lifeline that reminds us of the ultimate human truth. We are vulnerable, but we are not alone. We are part of God's world. Prayer is a response to that profound realization that, as Hush Puppy says in that wonderful film, The Beasts of the Southern Wild, I'm a little bitty beast in a big, big universe. And that right there is a prayer. So prayer is really quite simple. We are the ones who tend to complicate it. And it was no different for Jesus' friends. Judaism has at least as many ways to pray as Christianity. But when Jesus' friends ask him what is the best way to pray, he doesn't tell them to go get out their scriptures or their catechism and start memorizing and reciting. Here's what he says. Turn to God and say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us our daily bread. And forgive our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. That's it. Or as Eugene Peterson translates it in the message, Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. And keep us safe from ourselves and from evil. These are the basics of life. To know God to live rightly, to stay alive, to be in relationship, and to be safe. This, Jesus tells us, is all we need. This is prayer 101, and the rest are just details. And this prayer he teaches us is pretty honest, too. Ask for what you need, Jesus says. Be direct. Don't play games. Don't worry about fancy vocabulary or bargaining. God will not be taken in by that. Just ask for what's on your heart. And don't worry if it sounds too big or too small. Oh, and one more thing. Don't give up. If you know your cranky neighbor will eventually open the door if you keep knocking, how much more quickly will God? If you know that even the most imperfect parent wouldn't hand his child a scorpion when she asks for an egg, how much more would God, who loves us beyond imagining, how much more would God give us what we need if only we ask? Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But here's where it gets a little dicey. Here's where many of us, including me, get stuck. This kind of simple, honest, persistent prayer requires enormous trust on our part. A radical leap of trust that God is there and that God loves us. And I know that sounds simple, but it is not easy. The tragedies of the world can undermine our trust. The terminal illness, the eviction notice, the earthquake. We can't escape the reality that we are dependent, vulnerable creatures, little bitty beasts, and that the universe often feels out of our control. So how can we trust that our needs will be met and that our lives will be safe in such a world? How can we trust that when it seems our prayers are so often unanswered, or worse, unheard, how can we trust? This is where that theological minefield comes in. And there is no simple answer to this question. But lots of simple answers are given. One of them is, God always answers our prayers, but sometimes the answer is no. And this may be true. Sometimes we are praying for things that are not in alignment with God's intentions for the world, things that would ultimately cause pain or harm. As Oscar Wilde says, when the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. But this explanation cannot account for the many times when our prayers for peace and wholeness and justice are in alignment with God's kingdom. We know that. And yet children still go to bed hungry and wars rage on. Another answer that is often given is everything happens for a reason. It's part of God's plan. Which is again 
problematic. For how could torture or abuse or starvation ever be a part of God's plan? True, we believe that God can bring good out of evil, but that's a long way from saying that evil is a part of God's plan. So what can we say? Not much with certainty, I'm afraid. Except this. God is not alone in this, and neither are we. When Jesus invites us to ask for God's kingdom to, co to come on earth, he is inviting us to be a part of it. In order for God to set the world right, we need to be on board. God is God, and we are not. But together, we make up the world. We are partners in God's dream for the world, which means that we need to be in relationship with God. We need God. And here's the heretical part. God needs us, too. And prayer is how that relationship grows. Prayer is how we share what's in our hearts and listen for what's in God's. Prayer is how we touch God's pulse and have our heart beat along with it. Prayer is not a formula that works. Prayer is an invitation to be in relationship with God, one that God offers us again and again and again. And Jesus' promise is that no matter what we face, God is with us. He promises us that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and he is the living embodiment of that. We pray because we trust this is true, or maybe we pray because we hope this is true, and sometimes that's good enough. The promise is not that prayer will take away our pain. We know this because Jesus prayed mightily and cried much. No, prayer guarantees only one thing, that our pain and our joy and our fear, all that make up our crazy, complicated, scary, and wonderful lives is shared with someone who loves us unconditionally. In the simple prayer that Jesus taught us, the one we share each time we gather, the one we shared together just moments ago, he hands us a lifeline to that relationship. As Anne Lamott writes, you've heard it all said that when all else fails, follow instructions. So we breathe. We try to slow down and pay attention. We try to love and help God's other children. And hardest of all, at least to me, learn to love our depressing, hilarious, and mostly decent selves. We get thirsty people water. We read to the very young and the very old. We listen to the sad. We pick up litter and try to make the world a slightly better place for our having been here. Those are the basic instructions. That's prayer 101, to which I can only add, Amen.